Hello everyone! Today I'm wrapping up a project that I started a little over a year ago. I've been reviewing adaptations of Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, and the last one I'm going to cover is the 1980 BBC version, a five-part adaptation that stars Elizabeth Garvey as Elizabeth Bennet and David Rintoul as Mr. Darcy. I've seen this version a few times before. When I was young, there was a channel that showed up. I think it was called the Romance Channel, but I'm not sure about that. It's long gone now. And they played it. We happened to catch it once. And then the next time they aired it, we caught it again and taped it on three VHS tapes, which I think we still have somewhere. I think it was kind of a novelty for me back then. Like, whoa, there's another really long movie about this story? At that point, my family was already very familiar with a different version, which stinks for this one because it means that it never had a chance to be judged on its own merit. We've always compared it to the other version. We couldn't help it. Still, even though we never fell in love with this version the way we did that one, we did revisit it a few times over the years. But the last time was a while ago, maybe as far back as 2013, which to me doesn't sound like such a long time ago, but it was six years, which um, is long enough for me to forget a lot, including how I actually feel about it. See, what always happens with this version, and this is so unfair of me, is that I fall into a certain way of thinking about it, and I have to convince myself to watch it again. I go into it thinking, eh, okay, let's give this another try. But then as I'm watching it, things turn around, I get into it, and by the end, I'm like, hey, that was pretty good. And then time goes by, I forget that that happened, and the cycle resets. I don't know why I always go back to thinking that this version is dull and stagey and not worth the four and a half hours that it takes to watch it. Maybe it has to do with the fact that that's what I thought when I was a little kid watching it for the first time. But I'm here to report, having just watched it, or watched it three weeks ago, if we're gonna be honest, that my feelings, in general, are pretty positive. This version is not especially fancy or popular, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have anything to recommend it. One could argue that it's the most faithful adaptation of the book out there. I'm not sure if I'm willing to commit to that. There's a tendency to think of these lengthy BBC adaptations from the 70s and 80s as word-perfect dramatizations, but they're not really. They do stick more closely to their source material than a lot of adaptations nowadays do, but they also find a way to put their own spin on things. I would say a perfect adaptation of Pride and Prejudice does not exist. But then I would also say that a perfect adaptation of most novels does not exist. That said, this version does include several scenes from the book that other adaptations drop, and expands dialogue where other adaptations shorten it for time. Before diving in, I do want to mention the artwork in the opening titles. Each part starts with a series of colorful drawings depicting key scenes from the episode. They're amusing to look at, with the characters and events heavily exaggerated, and they're especially fun to study if you're already familiar with what's coming up next. Alright, let's talk about characters and performances. Elizabeth Garvey does a fine job as Elizabeth Bennet. As a child, I don't think I appreciated her performance as much as I do now. Her Elizabeth is slightly more subdued. Mm, that's not to say she isn't playful, she is. She has a gentle sense of humor, and her wide-eyed expression belies the mischief in her mind when she sets out to tease or challenge someone. But I really sense that she undergoes a change, a maturation, as events force her to reevaluate the people in her life. She becomes more serious and introspective in the second half. That can be a tricky thing to convey, but I think Garvey manages it quite well. As for David Rintoul's Darcy, hmm. He nails the haughty side of Darcy very well. There's no question that he is proud and disdainful and kind of bored, though not so bored that he can't insult someone who he thinks needs a set down. Rintoul has a pleasant voice and nice intonation. Everybody in this adaptation speaks very clearly, with clean articulation. The problem is that they made him so sour and so stiff. He's kind of like a robot. That's one of the biggest weaknesses here. We see so much of proud, unlikable Darcy. Not enough of his better side. I know it exists. We see little inklings of it here and there. It's like, oh, you're trying. I know you're trying. 
He just doesn't seem to know how to not be rigid and stone-faced. And that's rough, because things are supposed to turn around here. We and Elizabeth are supposed to start seeing him in a better light and start falling for him. And when they meet again at Pemberley, yes, he is way more personable than he was before. It's almost a 180 degree flip. We even see him smile a couple times and it's like, whoa, I didn't know you had it in you. Unfortunately, I'm afraid it's not quite enough. We see comparatively little of Darcy's actual good personality. And it doesn't seem like Elizabeth sees enough of him to fall in love either, so when suddenly she's talking about how he'd be just the right man for her and would suit her perfectly, it's like, really? Are we talking about the same guy? I try to warm up to this Darcy. I really do. But it's an uphill battle. He does have his moments, I guess, but... Maybe they just did too good a job making him disagreeable in the first half. Or maybe they didn't have him go so far in the opposite direction on purpose, like they didn't want him to suddenly turn into a totally different person. That would be unbelievable. They did a few different things with Mrs. Bennet. I'd say Lydia is still her favorite child, which should be the case, but she's also a huge fan of Mary and boasts about her cleverness and her talents, which are questionable. She is not a fan of Elizabeth and is frequently criticizing her and pecking at her. Mrs. Bennet ended up being one of my favorite people to watch in this adaptation, and her interactions with her daughters added a lot of good, subtle comedy. Someone I was less of a fan of here was Mr. Bennet. He's more stern and sarcastic here than in other adaptations, even occasionally angry. Not that it isn't perfectly understandable for him to be this ornery, but even with Elizabeth, his favorite, he can be kind of abrupt. It's not what I'm used to. This version places a greater emphasis on the Bennets' less-than-ideal marriage. Elizabeth and Charlotte discuss it right at the beginning, and later Elizabeth becomes her father's harshest critic, acknowledging that while Mrs. Bennet is a foolish woman, that doesn't make her husband's rather abrasive treatment of her acceptable. How you view Mr. Bennet, I suspect, is largely influenced by the version you're most familiar with or fond of. In my case, it's the 95 version of him, which doesn't ignore his more negative traits, but does make him a more endearing character. When I make the general statement that I like or relate to Mr. Bennet, that's the character I'm referring to. That portrayal, and Mr. Bennet's in other adaptations as well, and the book Mr. Bennet. I don't feel the same way about this Mr. Bennet. His characterization is so harsh and forbidding, not all the time, but frequently enough to leave that impression, that I just don't warm up to him. Instead, I find myself thinking how I wouldn't want to find myself married to a man who says sarcastic things about me and disrespects me in front of other people, and how harmful it is for a man to ridicule his wife in front of their kids, or for a wife to humiliate her husband. It's a good thing we do see some positive interactions and a little levity between Elizabeth and her father, or else I might be in danger of deciding he's one of the antagonists, which I don't think was Austin's intent. During the first hour, I honestly wasn't too engaged in this adaptation, and I think that's the way it goes for me with a lot of adaptations of Pride and Prejudice. Main characters are introduced, relationships are established, Jane gets sick and has to stay at Bingley's house. Ho-hum, business as usual. The story picks up momentum in the second episode, thanks in part to the introduction of more characters who bring more conflict. Wickham's entrance propels the story forward, but I think it's actually the introduction of Mr. Collins that really improves things. I had forgotten what he was like here, and it was a treat to meet this total oddball again. He's a buoyant buffoon, extremely animated and ridiculously talkative, and his dancing is just mm, sublime. In part three, things get even better when Lady Catherine de Bourgh comes in. She's played by Judy Parfit, who was one of only two actors in the whole show who I knew for sure I had seen in something else. Lady Catherine talks and talks and talks and talks, bouncing from subject to subject with little correlation between them, speaking with all the authority of an expert on domestic issues that she really knows nothing about. I mean, why would she? She has a whole bunch of servants. She doesn't have to do her own housework. So where does she even hear about all this stuff? Her daughter Anne gets an interesting moment. When Elizabeth is leaving Rosings for the last time, Anne reaches out to her like she's trying to say, hey, 
I know I never interacted with you because I was too scared to speak in my mother's presence, but I want you to know that I like you. I think this moment made an impression on me when I was younger, as I've always wondered how things might have developed between the two of them after Elizabeth's marriage. I want them to become friends, and I want Anne to find her own happy ending. Another unusual characterization is that of middle child Mary Bennett, who I found to be the most memorable of Elizabeth's sisters here. She has all the traits you usually expect from Mary, except she does show an interest in men and preening and being social. She's the one who comes rushing in with news about the single young man who's taken Netherfield Park. And what's most surprising is her favorable reaction to Wickham's gallantry. Even Mary is affected when Wickham turns on the charm. Barf. I thought they did a nice job with the sisters, by the way. There are multiple scenes where they're all clustered together, and I enjoyed that. You get to see the different personalities interacting and contrasting, and I like the natural way they all occupy the same space. There are quite a few things in this adaptation that you don't see in any other. For example, the Pemberley visit is extended. It's not quite the same as what's in the book, but it's closer than any other version has gotten. And the gardener's conversation with the Hursts, where the good-natured gardeners politely agree with all their rude comments and exchange amused glances on the sly, is particularly enjoyable. Mrs. Gardner, by the way, is played by Barbara Shelley, classic Hammer Horror movie icon. Quite a different role from the ones she had in those movies. We also get to see that dinner party the Bennetts host after Bingley's return, which is usually left out. This is such a frustrating scene in the book, where all Elizabeth and Darcy want is a chance to talk to each other, but that one annoying lady won't let him get close. It's interesting to see this scene covered for once. The inclusion of such scenes beefs up episodes 4 and 5 quite a bit, and as a fan of the book, it's exciting to see so much of it brought to the screen. But I do admit that in spite of that, or maybe because of that, the second half feels kind of prolonged. And Elizabeth's turnaround on Darcy just feels so fast. Not her realization that she was wrong about his character, his letter and her reactions to it are covered in full, but beyond that, the process of her actually falling in love with him feels kind of vague to me. They do get to have a lengthy private conversation at the end where they're both finally open and relaxed with each other, and that's really good. But it's still so quick and a little hard to accept. I find it harder to accept here than it is in the book or other adaptations for some reason. I never quite get to the point where I'm convinced that, mm, yes, their personalities are compatible and I believe they're in love and they're going to be so happy together. So there's a sense of dissatisfaction for me at the end. But on the whole, I enjoy this adaptation. I'm on record now saying that, so hopefully I won't forget it again. There may not be anything I get really excited to see here, but there's nothing I hate about it either. Nothing that drives me crazy. And it gives its own twist to a familiar story. If you like that story and all that goes with it, you'd be bound to like it to some degree. So if you're a Pride and Prejudice fan, but you've passed on this one, I suggest you give it a try and maybe give it more than just an hour, because it's a little slow going at first, but it does get better. That concludes my last Pride and Prejudice review. There are other adaptations and variations out there, but at this point, I'm going to move on. In the last year, I've reviewed seven different adaptations of Pride and Prejudice, and I'm ready for something different. And I'm switching gears, too. I'm going to keep reviewing Jane Austen, but I'm not going to do it systematically. I don't want to lose my enthusiasm for this stuff, and I know that if I'm free to jump around from thing to thing, um, I'll enjoy it more, and the final product will be better. It might not be as organized or as thorough as it would be otherwise, but it will probably be more fun for everyone. And for those of you who are waiting for the next Jane Eyre adaptation comparison video, it's coming soon. I hope that you enjoyed this review. If you have seen this version of Pride and Prejudice, feel free to share your thoughts on it in the comments below, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.